Hello YouTube, in this video I want to contrast two forms of scepticism, which we can call suspension scepticism and dogmatic scepticism. These scepticisms are discussed in detail in Mark Walker's article, Under Determination Scepticism and Skeptical Dogmatism, and he gives an interesting new take on some classic sceptical arguments. So, scepticism, as we're using the term here, aims to cast doubt on what we can call the common sense hypothesis. Uh, so this is the common sense picture of uh, what we are and what our place is in the world. So it involves the claims that we have bodies and brains located inside our bodies, we live with other people and interact with various external objects, our sensory perceptions are mostly caused by the objects in the external world, our access to the world is autonomous in the sense that more powerful beings such as evil demons or advanced aliens or whatever do not influence our experiences or thoughts. I mean, they're, they're not sort of, you know, getting in between the stuff in the world and our experiences. And then uh, the world is at least many thousands of years old. So basically, we are not massively deceived about the way the world is. So our sensory perception provides mostly reliable information about objects in the external world. This is the picture that's assumed by most ordinary people and, I guess, by the sciences. I mean, science may have revealed many surprising things about what the external world is like, about what the world is like on a fundamental level, but it doesn't, well, arguably, it doesn't really challenge this common sense picture, this just sort of general reliability of the senses. Uh, indeed, arguably, it presupposes this picture. But we don't need to get into that. This is, this is the... Uh, hypothesis that scepticism aims to cast doubt on. Now the traditional sceptic will argue for suspension of judgment and they, they do this by trying to show that competing hypotheses are equipotent. So equipotent is, I'll just quote Sextus Empiricus here, equality as regards credibility and the lack of it, that is no one of the inconsistent statements takes precedence over the other as being more credible. So we have no idea which hypothesis is true, and as a result, we suspend judgment. So that so suspension of judgment is a state of the intellect on account of which we neither deny nor affirm anything. So, at least as Walker presents it, the traditional sceptic suspends judgment about the common sense hypothesis. In this sense, right, the traditional sceptic will neither affirm nor deny the common sense hypothesis. But there is an alternative kind of scepticism available here, which is the view that the common sense hypothesis is probably false. We shouldn't suspend judgment about the common sense hypothesis, rather we ought to disbelieve it, or at least lean towards disbelieving it. So we have two views on the table. First, there is suspension scepticism, which argues for suspending judgment about the common sense hypothesis. So these sceptics are going to say, well, you know, there's no justification for believing the common sense hypothesis, or at least I'm, I'm not sure whether there's justification, like, I don't know, okay? These sceptics will just say, look, I don't know, I neither, def I neither affirm nor deny. But then second, there's dogmatic scepticism, which argues that the common sense hypothesis is probably false. We are justified in denying the common sense hypothesis. So what kind of scepticism is the most compelling? Um, well, I mean, why exactly does the sceptic say that we should doubt the common sense hypothesis? Um, so the way that sceptics will often proceed here is by proposing a sceptical hypothesis, for instance, the brain and the vat hypothesis, and then they will say that this hypothesis is equipotent with the common sense hypothesis. So in the brain in the vat hypothesis, I am a brain in a vat. I am hooked up to a computer which is stimulating my brain in such a way as to create the appearance of an external world. All of my, all of my sensory experiences are produced by this supercomputer uh, manipulating my brain in just the right kind of way. And the point here, of course, is that the same set of experiences that I currently undergo could in principle be caused by very different things. So a, a brain in a vat that's being stimulated in the right kind of way would have exactly the same sort of experiences that I do. <clears throat> so from this we can state a kind of underdetermination argument, which uh, Walker puts as follows. So he says, well, 
you know, sort of two parts to this, right? First of all, the skeptic will say that there's no a priori principle that favours the common sense hypothesis over the brain in the VAT hypothesis. I have no a priori access to the fundamental nature of what, what it is that causes my experiences. So, like, I can't kind of work it out from the armchair, at least, you know, pr prior to experience, as it were, the causes of my experience could, could be almost anything. Um, you know, this is, this is not something that I have, you know, independent access to. Um, but second, I also have no empirical data that favours the common sense hypothesis over the brain in the VAT hypothesis, because my experiences would be indistinguishable if the brain in the VAT hypothesis were true. And, you know, like em empirical testing, if I'm, if I'm using empirical data to decide between two hypotheses, well, we have to do em empirical testing, and that involves deriving predictions about what we would observe or experience. But the common sense hypothesis and the brain in the VAT hypothesis are explicitly designed to be equally consistent with all experiences. They essentially make the same predictions. Um, so I have no evidence in favour of the common sense hypothesis. My total evidence is neutral between these hypotheses and, and therefore we reach this state of equipolence. The, so where, where E is my total evidence, we would say that the probability of the common sense hypothesis given E is equal to the probability of the brain in the VAT hypothesis given E. Therefore, I'm not justified in believing the common sense hypothesis. I should suspend judgment between these two hypotheses. Um, now, obviously, this, look, I mean, there are many ways we can push back against this argument, but this is the general type of argument that the sceptic is going to want to give. Um, so, uh, with that said, we can maybe put this a bit more formally as follows. This is Walker's uh, essentially Walker's way of putting the, the suspension skeptics argument. So first of all, we have this kind of underdetermination principle, which says if H1 and H2 are hypotheses and E is all of S's evidence, then S is justified in believing H1 only if the probability of H1 given E is greater than the probability of H2 given E. But second, all of S's evidence is neutral between the common sense hypothesis and the brain in the vat hypothesis. And so the probability of the common sense hypothesis given E is equal to the probability of the brain in the bat hypothesis given E, which must be equal to one half. It's 50 percent. Um, so we just don't know either way. So we're not justified in believing the common sense hypothesis. And of course, you know, it, given that it's that it's one half, we don't know either way. We neither affirm nor deny it. Um, this is one way to present the case for skepticism, which which leads us to. Uh, suspension of judgment. But notice that nothing that I've said here depends on the brain in the VAT hypothesis specifically. We could have run this same argument with a different sceptical hypothesis, such as the simulation hypothesis. Uh, the simulation hypothesis being that I am an electronic being in a simulation run on a powerful supercomputer. Um, I have a video on the simulation hypothesis, which you can check out if you're interested. So if you if you take the simulation hypothesis for, for this argument, then we get the result that the probability of the common sense hypothesis given E is equal to the probability of the simulation hypothesis given E. Um, and of course, skeptics have appealed to a variety of different skeptical hypotheses historically. But now here is where the dogmatic skeptic enters. See the, see, the brain in the VAT hypothesis is pretty clearly a competitor to the simulation hypothesis. The brain in the VAT hypothesis assumes that you have a material brain. The simulation hypothesis assumes that all of your experiences are realized by processes on a supercomputer. So these involve very different views of what the world is like. And so they are in competition. And moreover, precisely the same underdetermination argument can be made by contrasting the brain in the VAT hypothesis with the simulation hypothesis, right? There's there's no a priori reason to favour the brain in the VAT hypothesis or the simulation hypothesis. There's no empirical evidence that can decide between the brain in the VAT hypothesis and the simulation hypothesis. So the brain in the VAT hypothesis, given our evidence, the, the probability of the brain in the VAT hypothesis, given our total evidence, is equal to the probability of the simulation hypothesis, given our total evidence. But in that case, it looks like we no longer have an argument for suspension of judgment 
about the, the common sense hypothesis. If the probability of the common sense hypothesis is equal to the probability of the brain in the bat hypothesis, which is equal to the probability of the simulation hypothesis, then we ought to assign a credence of no greater than one third to the common sense hypothesis. So that's just to say that we ought to lean towards disbelieving the common sense hypothesis. If the probability of the common sense hypothesis is one third, then that's just another way of saying that the common sense hypothesis is probably false. And so now we have dogmatic skepticism. <clears throat> and I mean, the general problem for suspension skepticism <clears throat> is that, yeah, we have this variety of skeptical hypotheses, which are, you know, equipolent with the common sense hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> so the dogmatic skeptics argument looks like this. If H1 is a hypothesis and E is all of S's evidence, then S is justified in disbelieving H1 if the probability of H1 given E is less than one half. Maybe we'll say much less than one half. It doesn't really matter exactly how you state this. <clears throat> Premise two, all of S's evidence is neutral between the common sense hypothesis, the brain in the vat hypothesis and the simulation hypothesis. So the probability of the common sense hypothesis given E is equal to the probability of the brain in the vat hypothesis given E, which is equal to the probability of the simulation hypothesis given E, which is one third. Um, or maybe we should say cannot be greater than one third. So S is justified in disbelieving the common sense hypothesis. And, you know, we can we can put this as a challenge to suspension skepticism, right? If you think that the common sense hypothesis and the brain and the VAT hypothesis are equipotent, and you think that the common sense hypothesis and the simulation hypothesis are equipotent, then you must assign a low credence to the common sense hypothesis. You must hold that the common sense hypothesis is probably false. You must adopt dogmatic skepticism. And of course, our credence in the common sense hypothesis is going to be driven down further as we multiply different skeptical hypotheses, of which there are plenty. So we have, of course, the brain in the vat hypothesis. We have the dreaming hypothesis, which just claims that my whole life has just been a, a kind of dream. You know, just as I'm just as I dream at night, maybe I'm dreaming right now. Maybe I'm just going to sort of, you know, wake, wake up and, and this whole thing will just just be like, you know, the dreams that I've had at night are actually just dreams within dreams. And everything is very different from, <clears throat> you know, the way it seems to be. Um, there's Descartes' evil demon hypothesis, which proposes that I'm currently being deceived by an evil godlike being um, and, and omnip uh, an omnipotent omniscient being that's able to manipulate my experiences in just the right way is to create this illusion of an external world. There's the matrix hypothesis, which would propose that there are multiple people, all of their bodies held in tanks, interfacing with a computer system that creates a virtual reality. Um, the simulation hypothesis, as we've already seen, electronic beings whose minds and environments are created by processes in a supercomputer. There's the Boltzmann brain hypothesis, which <clears throat> basically proposes that the universe has undergone heat death and my brain was created just a moment ago from a random fluctuations of particles and will soon disappear again into the void. Um, again, I have a video on Boltzmann brains, which I will upload in the comments. Um, there's the idealist God hypothesis. So let's suppose that there's no material world. All that exists are representations within the mind of God. This is basically a kind of Barclayan idealism. Uh, imagine that God sort of decides to sort of play a movie in his mind, as it were, of a life exactly like mine. Um, and then you get this set of experiences <clears throat> just realized within the mind of God. Um, there are various unknown hypotheses. So consider that it took a great deal of theoretical and technological development before we were able to formulate the brain in the vat the simulation and the Boltzmann brain hypotheses. Uh, these are hypotheses which have been proposed, you know, and the matrix hypothesis. And <laughs> actually, the, you know, these are hypotheses which have been proposed um, kind of in response to developments in science and technology. Uh, so there may be other skeptical hypotheses which are currently unconceived. Um, you know, may, maybe there are hypotheses that are just 
unconceivable in principle. Uh, think of Kant's distinction between the phenomena and the noumena, and the idea that the noumenal world is entirely beyond our grasp. I mean, there are serious philosophical arguments for positions like this. I mean, Kant didn't intend his position to be a sceptical one, but we might think, well, it's a pretty short step to scepticism. If I have access only to, you know, representations, and I know nothing of what lies beyond, I, I, I have no way of accessing, you know, the world as it is in itself, then um, I mean, it, you know, it seems like I don't know what the world as it is in itself is like. Uh, things could be very, very different from how they seem. Um, in any case, the point is, is that there are a variety of sceptical hypotheses on the table. If we have three equipotent hypotheses, our credence in the common sense hypothesis is only one third. As we multiply empirically equivalent competitor hypotheses, the probability of the common sense hypothesis goes down even further. Um, so we've got at least seven sceptical hypotheses here, which gives us a probability of no greater than one eighth for the common sense hypothesis. Um, that's going to be lower if we factor in potentially unconceived sceptical hypotheses. Um, and of course, these aren't the only sceptical hypotheses that people have proposed. So yes, the probability of the common sense hypothesis is pretty damn low, according to the dogmatic sceptic. So the dogmatic sceptic will allege that suspension scepticism is unstable. In order to suspend judgment about the common sense hypothesis, we need to assign it a credence of 50%, which means assigning a credence of 50% to the whole set of sceptical hypotheses. So that is, the probability of the common sense hypothesis equals the probability of not the common sense hypothesis. But the trouble is, is that not common sense hypothesis is a very large conjunction, right? This covers the brain in the vat, the simulation, dreaming, etc. So suspension scepticism assigns a credence of 50% to this large conjunction of all sceptical hypotheses. If there are 10 sceptical hypotheses in this sceptical set, then this would require a credence of 5% in each one. But notice that if we have these credences, then the original underdetermination argument for scepticism must fail. If you have a credence of 50% in the common sense hypothesis, but only a credence of 5% in the brain in the bat hypothesis, for instance, or well then you deny that the common sense hypothesis and the brain in the bat hypothesis are equipotent. There must be something that epistemically favours the common sense hypothesis over the brain in the bat hypothesis. So they're not underdetermined. So the standard argument for scepticism uh, would therefore su support dogmatic scepticism, not suspension scepticism. Like if you claim that common sense and brain in the vat are equipotent, then that favor, then you can't say, well, common sense hypothesis is 50% and brain in the vat is 5%. Um, so, <clears throat> so that standard argument would, uh, as Walker sees it, favors dogmatic, favors dogmatic scepticism. Another way to look at this is that there are many different parts to the common sense hypothesis. So as we articulated it uh, earlier in the initial part of this video, the common sense hypothesis consists of at least five claims. And different sceptical hypotheses will target different parts of the common sense hypothesis. So, you know, if the suspension, the suspension sceptic has a credence of 50% in the common sense hypothesis, well, that means she must have a relatively high credence in each part of the common sense hypothesis, say, you know, about 90% or whatever. The common sense hypothesis can only be true if all of its parts are true. But, but you see, the trouble is, is that these sceptical arguments seem to show equipotence for each part. Um, and that forces us to have a very low credence in the conjunction of these parts. Like, if you have a, a credence of 50% in P and 50% in Q, where P and Q are independent claims, well, then you can't have a credence of 50% in the conjunction P and Q. Um, so, so if we're able to show equipotence for, like, each part of the common sense hypothesis, if we're, if we're saying, okay, we assign, uh, like, a credence of 50% to part A, a credence of 50% to part B, etc., then it looks like our credence in the conjunction of all of these parts should be quite low. Um, or to approach this in another way, if we suppose we have a credence of 50% in the common sense hypothesis, well, notice that all we would need to do to push that over the line towards belief is drop one of those parts, just make it a bit less specific. So, you know, we might drop, for instance, E, 
the claim that the world is at least many thousands of years old. Um, or we might drop the idea that we're committed to there being a mind independent world or whatever. So we can we can take a sort of modified common sense hypothesis, which consists of claims A, B, C, D, but not E. Um, since our modified common sense hypothesis has weaker commitments than the original common sense hypothesis, it has a higher probability, which means if we assign a probability of 50% to the common sense hypothesis, this modified hypothesis must have a probability above 50%. Um, so we see that, uh, well, as the, the, what Walker would argue, is that suspension scepticism leads quite quickly to anti-scepticism. Suspension scepticism leads quite quickly to belief. Um, belief in a more, just in a weaker claim. Right then, quick advert. So if you, um, if you like my videos, you can support me on Patreon. Uh, I upload bonus videos on Patreon, so there's, um, you know, more content available on there uh, or, or, uh, where I will give further thoughts on the topics that I talk about on my channel uh, or, or just a one-off donation on PayPal. Obviously, anything that you can uh, that you can give is really appreciated. It helps the channel. I also offer private tutoring in philosophy. Um, email if you're interested. I have a degree, master's and PhD in philosophy, so I'm qualified. Um, and join the Discord. I have a Discord. Links to all this will be in the description. And... If you're not interested in any of that, at the very least, give the channel, uh, you know, a, a like, give the video a like, leave a comment, because any engagement at all is very helpful. Um, it helps the, uh, the YouTube algorithm, uh, helps the video get noticed. So, let's, let's get back to scepticism. So, dogmatic scepticism raises some interesting challenges for the... Uh, standard responses to scepticism. So, first of all, a common response to scepticism is to appeal to inference to the best explanation. Again, I have a video on this, inference to the best explanation is a response to scepticism, which I will link in the comments. Um, so, the claim here is that, well, this is the anti-skeptics claim. The anti-skeptic will say, look, we ought to believe whatever theory best explains the data where best explanation is determined by weighing up the weighing theories against explanatory virtues like simplicity so you know recall occam's razor do not multiply entities beyond necessity believe the simplest hypothesis that accounts for the data and then the argument will be that the common sense hypothesis is a better explanation it scores better um on these explanatory virtues um and this therefore breaks the tie between the common sense hypothesis and the skeptical hypothesis. So yes, you know, the common sense hypothesis and the brain in the bat hypothesis can both accommodate the empirical data, they both accommodate our experiences, but the common sense hypothesis is a better explanation, maybe because it's simpler, right? So we might say, um, you know, yes, we have these two hypotheses, common sense hypothesis is a simpler hypothesis, and so we should favour it for that reason. Okay, let's assume for the sake of argument that simplicity weighs in favour of a hypothesis. Still, simplicity is not absolutely watertight evidence, right? I mean, we might say, well, it gives us some reason to believe a hypothesis. It, it increases our credence in a hypothesis somewhat, but it's not going to increase it all the way to 100%. Uh, after all, there are you know, there are many respects in which the world is not simple. Sometimes the simplest hypothesis does turn out to be false. Um, so, so here's the thing, in the context of suspension scepticism, this doesn't really matter because, okay, the suspension skeptic has a credence of 50% in the common sense hypothesis, provided that simplicity has some evidential weight, provided it has any evidential weight at all, well, that's going to tip the scales in favour of the common sense hypothesis. But if we're dealing with dogmatic scepticism, things are not so straightforward. Because we can grant that the, we can just grant, okay, the common sense hypothesis is simpler than any skeptical hypothesis. So that does, in a sense, tip the scales towards the common sense hypothesis. Relative to any particular skeptical hypothesis, the common sense hypothesis is preferable. But it may well be that relative to the whole set of skeptical hypotheses, the common sense hypothesis is still very improbable. So it may be that the probability of the common sense hypothesis is greater than the probability of the brain in the bat hypothesis. 
And it may be that the probability of the common sense hypothesis is greater than the probability of the simulation hypothesis. But it does not follow that the common sense hypothesis is probably true. It does not follow that the, com the probability of the common sense hypothesis is greater than the probability of the brain in the vat hypothesis or the simulation hypothesis. So suppose we have a credence of 40% in the common sense hypothesis, 30% in the brain in the vat hypothesis, and 30% in the simulation hypothesis. Um, well, then we'd still say the common sense hypothesis is probably false. And of course, as we multiply skeptical hypotheses, we can push the probability of the common sense hypothesis down pretty damn low. So, you know, suppose suppose we have 10 skeptical hypotheses, right? So in this case, if we if we buy if we initially take seriously the suspension skeptics the the um sorry, if we initially take seriously the dogmatic skeptics argument, then that's going to leave us with a credence of about 9% in the common sense hypotheses, because it's going to be one of 11 equipotent hypotheses. So we have a credence of about 9%. Now, by showing that the common sense hypothesis is simpler than any of these other hypotheses, well, we increase our credence in it. But how far do we push it up? I mean, maybe we increase our credence to, say, 20%. But it's not clear that simplicity weighs enough. It's not clear that simplicity is going to be powerful enough to push our credence all the way beyond 50%. Um, I mean, at the very least, that's not something we should just take for granted. We need, we now need to give some account of like, how much evidential weight does simplicity have? Um, and, and like, why? And so what's, what's the answer to that? Um, and, well, the dogmatic skeptic would say, look, defenders of the common sense hypothesis haven't sort of met this burden. Um, so the dogmatic skeptic raises a unique challenge, because the dogmatic skeptic can just grant that inference the best explanation is reliable. She can grant that the common sense hypothesis is a better explanation than any given skeptical hypothesis. But she can still insist that the common sense hypothesis is probably false. So the dogmatic skeptic can, can just grant quite a lot to the anti-skeptical opponent, but then still say, well, you know, Given, uh, you know, given the variety of skeptical hypotheses, given that they are consistent with the evidence, our, our initial credences should be such that, um, you know, these explanatory considerations do not push our credence uh, beyond 50%. So we still disbelieve the common sense hypothesis. So that complicates one of the traditional responses to skepticism. OK, another traditional response to skepticism is a kind of uh, a kind of pragmatic response. So if we're if we're talking to suspension skeptics, if we're talking to people who suspend judgment, well, maybe it's reasonable to say, look, we can appeal to pragmatic factors to favor the common sense hypothesis. I mean, I might reason like this. I might say, OK, look, fine. I have no evidence, like no, no evidence that supports the common sense hypothesis over the brain in the bat hypothesis. I'll just grant that. But first of all, there's also no particular reason to believe that the common sense hypothesis is false. So there are no defeaters for the common sense hypothesis. There is no positive evidence against it. Yes, there are these alternative hypotheses that are compatible with our evidence, but there's nothing in particular to favour these hypotheses. So, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing that we can say, you know, to sort of show that the common sense hypothesis is problematic. Um, second, the common sense hypothesis has numerous practical benefits. Um, for instance, by believing the common sense hypothesis, I am able to feel that I can enter into reciprocal relationships with other people. You know, I love my mother and I can feel that she is another person, she, she has a mind and she loves me. And it's like this, it's reciprocal in that way. Now, if I was to endorse any of these skeptical hypotheses, that would leave me alone, cut off from others, unable to form deep commitments. And that's a serious practical cost. So, you know, whatever I believe, I'm going to be taking a shot in the dark. I might as well take a shot on the, on the theory that opens up these practical benefits. I mean, this is basically the idea promoted by William James in his famous paper, The Will to Believe. James argues that when there's no evidence that decides between two hypotheses and when there's, you know, significant, significant practical benefits to believing one of the hypotheses, then it's rational to allow your belief to be guided by the passions. Um, because, okay, so in this particular case, right, uh, 
by suspending judgment about the external world, I lose out on the potential benefit of the sense of a deep commitment with others. And, and crucially, that's a risk, right? So by suspending judgment, I'm, I'm taking a risk um, in just as much a, a way as that, you know, somebody who holds a belief is taking a risk. So if you choose to hold a belief in the common sense hypothesis, yes, you are taking a risk. You're taking the risk of holding a potentially false belief. Um, but if you suspend judgment about the common sense hypothesis, you're also taking a risk. You're, you're now risking the, you know, loss of what may be um, very great practical benefits. Um, so in, in that case, you know, it's just a matter of what risk do you want to take? Uh, uh, when there's no evidence that decides between these hypotheses, let's go with the hypothesis that promises these, these wonderful fruits. That's the basic idea. But now if dogmatic skepticism is right, uh, this approach looks a little bit less reasonable. I mean, it's one thing to take a shot on the most practically appealing view when there's no evidence either way. It's another thing to favour the most practically appealing view when we think that we have a good argument against that view. Because at that point, it looks like we're just engaging in wishful thinking. Like if there's, if we have a good case against some hypothesis, then you just say, well, I, you know, look, that hypothesis is practically appealing, so I'm going to believe it anyway. Um, hmm, that seems that seems a bit more problematic. So by comparison, suppose you're lost in the woods and there's two paths available to you. One path is bright and sunny, sunny. The other is shrouded in darkness. You know, it's wet and muddy. There's spiders and snakes hanging from the trees. You have no idea which way leads home. Um, but, you know, you have to take a shot, right? So you might as well go with a more appealing path. You might as well take the bright and sunny path. But now consider the same situation, except you have a map. And the map shows that the brighter path doesn't lead home. It just leads deeper into the woods, at least as far as you can tell. Um, you don't know where the dark path goes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you have evidence that the sunny path doesn't go home. Um, in that situation, it... it does kind of look, uh, well, the argument would be, look, it's just irrational to take the sunny path. It's just wishful thinking at that point, right? You're believing something, you're believing that something is true against the evidence, just because you would like it to be true. Um, and I mean, obviously, this is, this is going to be a worry uh, about, about any version of the pragmatist response to, to skepticism. Like even, again, yeah, we can make this point, even with respect to um, pragmatist response to suspension scepticism. But I think this point becomes particularly uh, forceful when we're dealing with dogmatic scepticism. Like if the dogmatic sceptic, the dogmatic sceptic says, look, you have good reason to believe that this hypothesis is false. So to then say, well, I'm going to believe this hypothesis anyway, because, you know, it makes me feel comfortable or whatever. That just looks like wishful thinking. Okay, so this is dogmatic scepticism. So I want to consider a few objections to dogmatic scepticism. So we might say, um, uh, one, one way that we could try to defend suspension scepticism against dogmatic scepticism is by arguing that, well, yes, although there are this, there, there's a variety of sceptical hypotheses, there's also a variety of common sense hypotheses. After all, Within the common sense framework, we have developed a number of different theories about the way the world works. So there's, you know, Aristotelian cosmology, there's Newtonian mechanics, there's general relativity. And, you know, this is, this is, this is just what we find within, like, the history of physics, you know. Um, and then, of course, there's many other cosmologies postulated by other cultures. And all of these are basically different forms of the common sense hypothesis. Um, you know, these... Yeah, these all affirm the, um, the, the, the basic framework of common sense that we articulated at the beginning of the video. So, yes, there are many sceptical hypotheses, but these have to be weighed against many common sense hypotheses, hypotheses not just one. And so this restores equipolence. It's like for every sceptical hypothesis you cite, I can cite a common sense hypothesis. So one response to this uh, that Walker gives is that, well, the trouble is these many common sense hypotheses are not actually relevant alternatives. I mean, what's in question here is the general framework outlined at the beginning of this video. You know, we have bodies, brains located inside our bodies, we live with other people, etc. Um, for these different scientific hypotheses, this basic epistemic model is still the same. 
Um, so these scientific hypotheses are not competing with respect to our everyday knowledge of the external world. I mean, one way to sort of put this is that in the same way that we can multiply common sense hypotheses, we can multiply skeptical hypotheses. So, you know, we've said, look, we have Aristotelian cosmology, Newtonian mechanics, general relativity, and so on. Now, these are empirical theories. They make different predictions about what we will observe. And in this respect, they are compatible with all of the skeptical hypotheses. So take the simulation hypothesis. The simulators may have simulated an Aristotelian universe, or a Newtonian universe, or an Einsteinian universe, and so on. So there's not just one possible simulated universe. There's a whole host of possible simulated universes. So for any way that the common sense universe appears, we can stipulate that there's a simulated universe that appears the same way. And the same is going to go for all these other skeptical hypotheses. hypotheses. For any way that the common sense universe appears, there is an evil demon universe that appears that way. For any way the common sense universe appears, there's a brain in the vat universe that appears that way. And this, of course, is just a feature of the fact that sceptical hypotheses are designed so that my experiences would be indistinguishable if those hypotheses were true. So whenever you multiply common sense hypotheses, um, you're effectively multiplying sceptical hypotheses as, as well. Um, and so the dogmatic sceptic would say, well, no, the, 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 you still have, like a, a, I guess, a larger proportion of, of sceptical hypotheses against common sense hypotheses. All right, another objection to the dogmatic sceptic is that dogmatic scepticism appeals to an illegitimate indifference principle. So the indifference principle uh, says that in the absence of any information, you should distribute your credence equally among all possible hypotheses or all possible outcomes that are under consideration. So let's say that I make a six-sided die. And I say, what's the probability that this die will roll an even number? Now, of course, if the die is fair, well, you're going to have a credence of 50% in this. Okay, for each for each number, you have a credence of one six that it will of one in six that it will roll that number. Um, and so, you know, there's three evens and three odds, right? So you're going to say, okay, it's a credence of one half if the die is fair. But you don't know whether the die is fair. You don't know anything about this die other than the like all I've told you is it's six-sided that's it you have a six-sided die that is the extent of your information you don't know anything else about it so you don't know whether it's fair okay so now what should your credence that it will roll an even number be well the indifference principle would say you should still assign a credence of 50 percent to this and it's you know in this case it seems pretty plausible why that would be um because you might think well, okay, for all I know, the die is heavily weighted towards rolling one, right? But then, for all I know, it's heavily weighted towards rolling two, and so on for every other number. So, yeah, I have no reason to think it's fair, but I also have no reason to think that it's weighted in any particular direction, as it were. So, in the absence of any information, all of these different possible biases, like, cancel out, as it were. Like, it's Yes, it's possible that it's weighted towards one, but it's possible that it's weighted towards two, possible that it's weighted towards three, and so on. Um, so all I know is that there are six possible outcomes, so I should just distribute my credence equally among these outcomes, and that leaves me, again, with a credence of 50% that it will roll an even, an even number. And so the same sort of reasoning appears to be going on with the dogmatic skeptic, right? Like, why are we assigning an equal probability to these skeptical hypotheses? Well, presumably we're appealing to some sort of indifference principle. The point is, there's no information that favors the common sense hypothesis over the brain in the vat hypothesis. I mean, you know, yes, anti-skeptics will argue that there is information that favors that, but we're putting that to one side. Um, all my evidence is equally consistent with both hypotheses. Similarly, there's no information that favours the common sense hypothesis over the simulation hypothesis. There's no information, like we have this set of hypotheses, there's no information that favours any of these hypotheses over any of the others. And so we just as assign an equal credence to all of them. Like the idea would be that given, given n competing hypotheses, um, of which the common sense hypothesis is one, and then no evidence that favours any of these hypotheses, the indifference principle tells us to assign a credence of 50% 
um, 1 divided by n to each hypothesis. And so, you know, if there's seven sceptical hypotheses and the common sense hypothesis, then we, we end up with a credence of 1 eighth in the common sense hypothesis. Um, so this seems to be how the argument is working. Now, the problem is, is that the principle of indifference uh, leads to various paradoxes. Um, there are lots of people would say, well, we, we actually shouldn't accept the principle of indifference. Um, so here's, here's one example. Um, let's say that we know that a man is currently in one of three countries. He's in France or Ireland or Great Britain. That's all the information we've been given. So what's the probability that the man is in France? Well, it looks like it's one third. OK, we've got three outcomes. We don't have any information, any further information. So one third. Um, but here's the thing. We could partition the outcomes differently. So we could say the man is in France or he's in the British Isles. Now, what's the probability that he's in France? Well, if you if you assign, if you take the principle of indifference, we now have to say one half. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but that's absurd. Um, you know, it can't be both, right? I mean, like all, all we've done is just describe the outcomes differently. And it doesn't look like, I mean, here's the thing. Both of these descriptions of the outcomes are perfectly acceptable, right? I mean, you, so you can say France, Ireland, Great Britain, or you can say France and the British Isles. Like, that's, those are both perfectly acceptable descriptions of, you know, uh, places in the world. Um, so, so this is, uh, and obviously this could be, you know, we could, we could alter this endlessly. We can divide up these locations endlessly and end up with a uh, very different, you know, probabilities that the guy is in France. Uh, here's a famous example from Bas van Frassen. Uh, suppose that there's a factory that creates cubes. <clears throat> it creates cubes with edge lengths anywhere between zero to two centimeters. Um, we, we ask, what's the probability that the next cube will have an edge length from zero to one centimeters? Well, by the principle of indifference, it looks like you assign a credence of one half to this. After all, the range from zero to one centimeters covers half the possible lengths. Um, but now consider, what's the probability that this cube, uh, cube has a volume from zero cubic centimeters to one cubic centimeter? This corresponds to the same outcomes as the edge lengths from zero to one centimeter. So it looks like, oh, it should be one half. But the problem is, is that edge lengths from zero to two centimeters correspond to volumes from zero cubic centimeters to eight cubic centimeters. So, we're, so if we ask, what's the probability the cube has a volume from zero to one cubic centimeters? Well, now the outcome space, you know, that's only like one eighth of the outcome space. So by the principle of indifference, we assign a probability of one eighth that the cube will have this volume um, because the cubes go from zero to eight cubic centimeters. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is a straightforward contradiction, the same outcomes. So if you describe the outcomes in terms of edge length, we get a probability of one half that it will be from zero to one centimeter. Um, but if you describe it in terms of volume, we have a probability of one eighth that, that, that it will be from zero to one cubic centimeter. But those are the same outcomes. <laughs> so, again, this is a problem. Um, so if we deny the principle of indifference, well, you know, it looks like we can block the dogmatic skeptics argument. Um, OK, we have no grounds for favouring the common sense hypothesis over any of the sceptical hypotheses. All of these hypotheses are equally well supported by our evidence. But without the principle of indifference, this doesn't commit us to taking it that each hypothesis is equally probable. Um, so, I mean, on the one hand, maybe this <clears throat> maybe this supports the suspension sceptic, but then... I mean, we might say, look, it's not clear how this helps the suspension sceptic. After all, the suspension sceptic herself also appears to be relying on an indifference principle. Because, you know, why shouldn't we assign a high probability to the common sense hypothesis? Well, the suspension sceptic's point is there's no information that favours the common sense hypothesis over the brain in the vat hypothesis. Um, and so the suspension sceptic applies the principle of indifference and assigns 50% to each. Um, at least that's the way that Walker presents the argument. <clears throat> um, so maybe this doesn't really favour the suspension sceptic either. 
Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that merely denying the principle of indifference doesn't get us very far here. Uh, at best, all that follows from this is that we have no way of reliably assigning credences in conditions of ignorance. It doesn't follow that we're justified in assigning a high credence to the common sense hypothesis, uh, for the same reason that it wouldn't follow that we were justified in assigning a high credence to any of the sceptical hypotheses. Merely denying the principle of indifference doesn't tell us which hypothesis to favour. And so I think this does leave the door open for a kind of suspension scepticism, which brings me to the final point I will discuss here. What exactly is suspension of judgment supposed to involve? So Walker appears to assume that to suspend judgment about some hypothesis is to assign a credence of 50% to that hypothesis. I mean, the idea is, look, we neither believe it nor disbelieve it. We neither lean in favour of it nor against it. We're neutral. And so if neutrality is to be represented by a credence, well, it looks like 50%. But there is... There are other options here, actually, which is, well, what about just not assigning any credence at all? Um, or what about assigning a completely vague credence? So when I suspend judgment about some hypothesis H, I might say not that I have a 50% credence in H, but that I just, I just don't assign a credence. There's just, I don't put any number on it. Or I might say, okay, I have a credence, but the credence is just somewhere in the interval between zero and one, but I can't make it precise. Um, I just, so, you know, there's either like no number or there's a maximally vague number. Um, and so the result then of, you know, if I then give the, the if this is how I'm thinking about suspension of judgment, the result of the underdetermination argument is not that the probability of the common sense hypothesis is equal to the probability of the brain in the vat hypothesis, which is equal to 50%. It's that I would just have no idea what probability to assign to either. So when you ask me what I think of the common sense hypothesis, all I can do is just shrug my shoulders. Um, and so this allows us to distinguish three forms of scepticism. We have the dogmatic skeptic who disbelieves the common sense hypothesis. So the dogmatic skeptic will assign a credence of much less than 50% to the common sense hypothesis. Then we have what we can call specified suspension scepticism. The specified suspension skeptic assigns a credence of 50% to the common sense hypothesis. And then we have unspecified suspension skepticism, which um, would assign, uh, assigns either just no credence, just no number, or assigns a maximally vague credence, credence anywhere between zero and one. And I think it's worth noting that arguably unspecified suspension scepticism better captures the state of mind to which skeptics have traditionally been aiming. Um, I won't push this point, but I, I do think there's a... So I think that there's a sense in which the the vague credence or, or just not assigning a credence that seems to involve a kind of deeper sort of suspension than assigning a 50 percent credence like the specified suspension skeptic doesn't know whether the common sense hypothesis is true but she can tell you what the probability of it is and she can tell you that it's more or less probable than other hypotheses um you know she can compare it to other hypotheses and sort of say yes this is more likely than that or this is less likely than that the unspecified suspension sceptic doesn't know whether the common sense hypothesis is true, and she doesn't even know its probability. She just, you know, she has no idea. And so, you know, if you ask her to compare the common sense hypothesis to some other hypothesis, she just doesn't know. She has no idea what to say. So that seems like, you know, in a sense, there's a kind of deeper sort of suspension happening in the case of the unspecified suspension sceptic. But in any case, if this is my attitude to the common sense hypothesis, then it surely wouldn't be right to say that I actively disbelieve it, as the dogmatic sceptic does. But at the same time, multiplying sceptical hypotheses is not going to make any difference. I mean, maybe I can say in the abstract that, well, you know, the more competitor hypotheses there are on the table, the less plausible the common sense hypothesis is. But if I begin with a totally vague credence for the common sense hypothesis, I have no idea how these competitor hypotheses should affect my credence. 
Um, again, all I can do is shrug my shoulders. Um, and I mean, this also allows us, it's, it's worth uh, noting that this also allows us to deal with these worries about the indifference principle. Um, so here is a modified indifference principle. A modified indifference principle says, well, in the absence of any information concerning the competing hypotheses, you assign no credence or you assign a maximally vague credence among the various hypotheses. Um, now, so yeah, in the, in the absence of any information, you just don't know, and that's that. Uh, well, if this is, so first of all, um, this modified indifference principle uh, is not going to lead to any particular paradoxes, as far as I know. Um, and if this is the view that we take, then, okay, let's say, the, so the unspecified suspension skeptic she compares the common sense hypothesis with the sceptical hypothesis, such as the brain in the vat hypothesis. She concludes that nothing favours the common sense hypothesis. Then she applies the modified indifference principle and just gives up her credence. She just has no idea, right? She doesn't assign 50%. She just, she, she just assigns a maximally vague credence or no credence at all. Um, and so then that's going to mean that when you then present these various other sceptical hypotheses. Um, I, I mean, that's not going to, like, push her credence in the common sense hypothesis down because there's nothing to push down. Um, she has no idea what number she's going from and to. I mean, so if you say, OK, we've got two hypotheses on the table, uh, so I assign 50% to the common sense hypothesis, then when you put three hypotheses on the table, you can say, ah, yes, we go from 50% to you know, one third, right, to 33.33%. But um, if you just start out with either no credence in the common sense hypothesis or a completely maximally vague credence, then once you put that third hypothesis on the table, you have no way of saying how that should affect, <laughs> like, where your credence ends up. Um, so, so yeah, m m maybe this modified indifference principle better captures um, the sort of argument that the Suspend, that the suspension skeptic would, would want to give. Um, and maybe it better captures the, the sort of state of mind to which skeptics have traditionally been aiming. Um, so, but in, but in that case, um, you know, this might be a way of defending uh, suspension skepticism over dogmatic skepticism. Um, <clears throat> okay, then, I'm going to wrap it up there. So uh, thank you for watching, and I will uh, see you in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.